What's up YouTube, I'm Guy, and today on the channel we're going to be checking out a micro brand. The brand in question, Vero, from Portland, Oregon, of all places. That makes this watch a little bit more interesting than some of the typical watches that we're normally accustomed to having on the channel here today. It's a watchmaking company based in the United States of America. Speaking of America, the... Uh, owner of this watch that loaned this in for review. He's loaned me several watches so far and a big thank you to him. He actually founded the Facebook group American Horology. It's a group based around sharing and discussing American-made wristwatches. So if you're interested in American-made wristwatches, you should go check out the American Horology Facebook group. I'll have a link down below in the description of this video if you're interested in that. Now, as you might expect, an American-made product, specifically an American-made wristwatch, probably going to be a little bit more expensive than its Swiss and especially Japanese competitive options. And I accept that. I know that that's going to be the case. This watch comes in at a price point of just over $1,000, but I'll tell you, I think it's probably worth it. It's got a very good build quality, and I do accept that made in America means it's going to cost more money. All right, guys, here we have it. This is the Vero 36, 36 being the model number, Vero being the manufacturer. Again, based out of Portland, Oregon, so this is an American-made watch. And because it's an American-made watch, as you might expect, it's a little bit more expensive than a typical entry-level watch. And this does sort of, at least at a quick glance, it does sort of look like an entry-level watch. I'll, I'll be honest. It's $1,080, and if you take a quick glance at this watch, you might think this is a two or $300 watch. If you dig a little bit deeper though, you can see that it's actually much higher quality than a simple entry level watch. But you are paying a premium because it's a micro brand and it's made in America. That's just the way it goes. If you want an American made product, you're gonna pay more for it. Now, I'll talk more about the value of this piece in my closing thoughts, but suffice to say that, yeah, this is actually a very well-made product. Let's first go over the specifications because there are some things I dislike about it. Mostly it's to do with the overall style and aesthetic though. Uh, the overall dimensions, 36 millimeters in case diameter from edge to edge, not including the crown. There's no crown guards on this case. Lug width where the strap attaches to the case, 18 millimeters. Lug to lug from tip to tip from one extremity of the case to the other. 43 millimeters, but that's what their website says. On my calipers, it comes in closer to 42 millimeters lug to lug. 42, maybe 42 and a half. And the overall thickness, including this uh, slightly domed sapphire crystal, very thin actually, nine and a half millimeters. Overall, there's some problems with the dimensions for me. I'll get to that in a second though. So the other basic features on this watch, while we don't have a screw down crown, we do get 100 meters of water resistance, which is nice. We also have a box sapphire crystal, kind of a slight dome, if you will. Very nice as well. We have an exhibition case back, and that crystal on the case back, also a sapphire crystal. The dial is interesting, and we'll talk more about it in, in a few minutes, but it's a nickel-plated brass dial with a uh, ceramic coating, is how they describe it on their website. I'll bring in some real close kind of macro shots for you to take a look at it. While the dial is sort of simplistic in design, it does seem to be very nicely made. Equally, the handset is very nice as well. It's a high-polished black oxide stainless steel. And again, it does have a little bit of superlumino voluminescence on the hour and the minute hands. And finally, the movement. It is a really nice movement, actually. It's a Salida SW210. The 210 is basically a hand-wind-only version of the Salida SW200. The nice thing about this particular movement, as installed by the Vero watchmaking company, it is highly regulated, regulated in six positions to plus or minus five seconds per day. So when you look at that price point, don't just gloss over the fact that this is a very highly regulated movement. Now, if you don't value accuracy, then that's not going to be important to you. But don't dismiss the price of this watch as being exorbitant if you aren't willing to account for the fact that 
that accuracy comes with a price. You have to pay for that. Now, other basic information about this movement. It's 19 joules. You have a 42-hour power reserve. It is a handwind-only movement. And, of course, it does have stocks, excuse me, stop seconds hacking when you pull the crown out. Speaking of that crown, very nicely done. You can see it's signed with the Vero logo. The knurling or texturing on the edge of the crown is sort of like a coin-edged engraving. Very easy to operate the crown for hand winding. Very easy to pull the crown out to the first position in order to hack the movement and set your time as needed. The case is well done. 316L stainless steel. Overall finishing is... Honestly outstanding, if I can get it to pick up good on camera here. Entirely brushed, satin brush, stainless steel finishing, it looks great. You'll notice that the lugs are perforated or drilled, so you can easily remove the strap and change it out with something else if you want to. Yeah, overall the case is really well done in terms of fit and finish. My complaints also start with the case in a number of ways. Number one, the 18 millimeter lug width. I honestly can't stand watches that are 18 millimeter lugs. I don't like 18 millimeter straps. The extremely popular Seiko SNK 809 is a 37 millimeter diameter watch with 18 millimeter lugs. I can't wear that watch and I don't think I could wear this one either. I often like 36 millimeter or 37 millimeter di diameter cases, but not with such a thin lug width or a thin strap. It just feels too delicate or almost feminine on my wrist. I just don't prefer it. And that's going to be my first big complaint about this watch. Purely subjective. This might not affect the vast majority of you guys out there watching this video, but that's just the way that I feel about it. I also find that the lug to lug 43 millimeters is what they list on their specs, but on my calipers, closer to 42 millimeters is a hair too short. It just makes the overall watch feel even smaller. Couple that with these very, very thin, delicate lugs, and yeah, it's just a very small, petite presentation. It has very little presence on the wrist. I don't really enjoy wearing it because it feels so small. If they moved these lugs out to be 20 millimeters, if they bulked them up with a little bit more metal or material here, I think that you could keep this 36 millimeter diameter case and it would wear perfectly. As a matter of fact, a 36 millimeter Rolex Datejust on paper has very similar dimensions. 36 millimeters, both watches, but the Datejust is 20 millimeter lugs and this is 18. Both the Datejust and this watch have roughly 43 millimeter lug to lug widths, but of course the Datejust has much more of a, of a body or shoulder on the actual profile of the lugs. So that watch wears wonderfully in my uh, opinion, whereas this one wears a little bit small and it feels very delicate on the wrist. Another problem I have with this watch is the overall style or aesthetic of the dial. Now I think the materials or the construction of the dial is honestly outstanding. Again, it's a nickel plated brass dial and on the website they say that it is ceramic coated. I don't understand that process, but I can tell you that under magnification looking at this dial, it looks very nice. I'll try to get in real, real close here and let you see. It's almost got like an orange peel, kind of texture on the dial. I don't know how well that'll show on camera. It might just look like a matte flat dial. Uh, but yeah, it, it does have this nice orange peel sort of texture to it, maybe because of that ceramic coating, maybe because it's nickel plated brass. I don't exactly know. Overall though, it looks good in terms of quality, in terms of materials, but the style is somewhat boring. The handset is outstanding. We have high polished black oxide steel and again with a little bit of superluminova on the hour and minute hands. The loom is all but useless. I mean, yeah, it works, but without any loom anywhere else on the dial, it's a little bit difficult to tell what time it is in low light. I guess, you know, you get a pretty good general idea, but you know, is it 10, is it 11? That can become tricky without loom on any other portions of the dial. Uh, overall, though, the quality of the handsets, again, if you look at them up close and under magnification, it looks very, very nice. Box Sapphire Crystal is also nice. It's got a bit of a dome, as you can see. We sort of panning here into profile. 
and yeah, it's, it's well done. It is of high quality. You don't really have any problems with glare, though I find that on watches with white dials, or sort of creamy off-white in this case, even if there's no AR coating on the crystal, generally you don't have problems with glare. Generally it's still pretty legible, with, with the exception of the absolute brightest hot spots like the studio light shining on the dial right now. The brown leather rally style strap that this watch comes on is very nicely done. There's a simple satin brush buckle. There's a very slight contrasting stitching going on throughout the entire strap. It's uh, overall excellent. My only complaint about this strap is it's not lined on the underside. And while that's not entirely necessary, I would say that, you know, with a watch that's coming in at an, oh, slightly over $1,000 in price, uh, the, and, and if it's going to come on a leather strap, the strap sh sh should at a minimum be lined. It should have that little extra bit of, you know, higher quality materials. Uh, but overall, yeah, it is a good strap, so it's not really a major complaint. So here it is on my six and three quarter inch wrist, a little bit smaller than... I would personally prefer. And again, on paper, the dimensions don't sound bad. 36 millimeters is an okay sized watch. Uh, 43 millimeters lug to lug is not too short, but that 18 millimeter lug width, that basically very thin profiled strap doesn't work for me. The fact that the overall profile of the lugs are so tapered, thin, or delicate just makes the watch feel even smaller than it really is. Overall, yeah, it's simple, it's plain. It does actually look pretty good on the wrist. If you're going for that sort of summertime, you know, no worries, no cares kind of attitude, like, that's the type of watch that it is. And, you know, in that role, sure, it does work. Uh, just not the style that I prefer. Uh, but overall, I think it's a very high quality watch. I think that the materials and the overall build, I think it's really well done. So yeah, that's going to wrap this up. Stick with me for another minute or two for my closing thoughts. I want to talk about value a little bit and whether or not I think that at $1,080, this is a decent value. So what are my thoughts on this timepiece by the Vera Watchmaking Company out of Portland, Oregon? Overall, I'm relatively impressed. I think it is a good build quality. I think that Overall, it's a very nice product. Stylistically, I think that it falls short in some areas, but that's just personal opinion. You know, just because I don't like the style, just because I don't like some of the overall size and scale or dimensions, uh, doesn't mean that that's a problem with the watch, and I'm sure it would be perfectly fitting for a great number of you guys out there. So plenty of people are going to say it's not worth the money, $1,080, it's too expensive. Value has a few components. Number one, there is a subjective component to value, but also there is the actual value of the product vis-a-vis -vis what you get for your money. And I think this is a good value. It's a good high quality product. There's another component of value, and of course that's retained or resale value. And I don't know what the retained or resale value on a watch like this would be. Probably not great because generally retained or resale value on micro brand watches just isn't great. But that subjective component to value, I guess I can't really argue against it. If it's not worth it to you, then it's just not worth it to you. There's probably $100,000 paintings on the wall of art galleries all over this country, and I can guarantee you that none of them are worth $100,000 to me. I'm just not an art appreciator. And if you look at this watch in that same sort of light or through that same lens, who am I to argue? I do think that it's a very nice product, though, and I was really happy to have it here for review. All right, guys, that's going to wrap this up. Thanks for tuning in. As always, if you'd like to help support the channel, down in the description of this video and every video I produce is a list of ways that you can help me out. Number one, follow me on my social media accounts, be it Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. I would appreciate that very much. Number two, I could always use more support over on Patreon. A uh, big thank you to the guys that have been over there supporting me on Patreon. I really do appreciate it. Finally, if you like anything that I've reviewed and you're thinking about purchasing it, click on my Amazon affiliate link first. I get a small commission for everything that you guys buy through that Amazon affiliate link. Big, big thank you to everyone that has been using it. Those commissions, while small, do indeed add up. All right, well, I'm going to wrap this up and say thanks again, and bye now.